So we will start again. So we will have two uh, presenters. The first one is Lauren Tilton from the University of Richmond. Uh, so, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, awesome. Uh, hope we're all doing well. And I want to thank again the organizers for all their incredible work to make uh, this, wow, uh, this three days happen. Rain or shine, amazing awesomeness. So thank you all so much. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about TV heritage, um, a multimodal approach, or at least the beginnings of a multimodal approach to TV uh, and I, uh, as a way of um, how we might be able to think about some multimodality. So just a little bit of introduction about where we're coming from. I run the Distant Viewing Lab with my colleague Taylor Arnold, whose work um, I'm presenting today also is a part of, and he's a part of as well, so in a, it's a collaborative work that I am uh, gonna be speaking about today. Um, and we work on work that thinks about uh, how to analyze visual culture and use it for tools as well, and thanks to those who came to the workshop the other day to talk about the toolkit. Um, some of our previous work has really focused on visual culture um, and mostly just looking at the images themselves. Uh, one of the projects is Photogrammer where we um, map the photographs and use some image similarity as well as another project called Addy that we did for the Library of Congress. And this was work to start to get under the hood of algorithms and to think about how they might be used on documentary images. So I just want to highlight that as some of um, kind of our earlier, some of our more early work that has been sort of uh, informing where we're headed now. I'm happy to answer any folks who are interested in that. Happy to talk about that in another in any time. But a lot of this work has um, been two things. One, it has been focused on still images, not time-based media or moving image, and also hasn't dealt as much with sound and other elements that have that make up images. Uh, we have done some work with captions, but um, more text and image, not image and sound. So. Um, but one of the things that has been uh, kind of a longer call in digital humanities for media studies has been to start to think across these different elements. So while the computational methods have not always been there, uh, been at the same level, right? We had a great conversation with Melvin, whose great piece on the visual digital turn talks about the computational affordances that have made possible um, image analysis and increasingly sound analysis, um, there actually have been calls in the field for a while to start to think across these, just not always the computational abilities to do that have aligned with the aspirations of different folks. So I highlight here a piece by Tara McPherson in 2009 saying media studies and digital humanities should be coming together um, and we need to think across modalities. Uh, and we've seen this call actually a lot in media studies over the last uh, two decades. Another piece of work then, but part of this got kind of parceled into two different pieces. Um, another really great project a book that came out in 2018 was Digital Sound Studies book with, by mary Kate Lingold and team who talked a lot about how digital humanities and sound could come together. And then we have Melvin's great piece and others and Thomas Smith's on visual, on visual here. And I've been a part of the visual. So the question I think is this why this conference is so important is how do we start putting those pieces together, particularly now of, because the computational affordances have become so much more, things are so much more possible. And we started to see that work starting to come together with some special issues like the one on audiovisual data and DH uh, that came out in Digital Humanities Quarterly. And I want to highlight that um, what, what, uh, it's really exciting to have people here today who were a part of that issue, like Peter Bo uh, uh, Broadwell's work on K-pop. If you would love to see an amazing paper on K-pop and music, music videos as a site of where we can understand performance and sound pose estimation there is really exciting. And also work from Mark and Tanya, who we've heard, um, thinking about annotation and sound. But still, even the special issue um, kind of still had kind of an A and a V. And so the question was how do we put the AV uh, together? And I want to note that this is not because people haven't wanted to or loved to, it's just the challenges of this work computationally. They're large, right? If you're working with moving images, they take a lot of space, they, they, 
get, the data gets large very, very quickly, and when you add sound, it gets large very quickly. And so it's a scale issue. Um, it's a storage issue. It's a computational power issue. It's a, the algorithms have changed really fundamentally in the last five to seven years, and I hate, I don't like to be overly um, talking about how over, emphasize technology, but I think that we could say that neural networks and now transformers have really made a fundamental, pretty big shift in what's possible. So this is some initial work we're starting to do to think about multimodality and TV studies. And this draws again on what uh, Melvin said, is that there's sort of folks come at this from different ways. And we tend to come to our theories and tools and practices by starting with a very specific set of case studies and build up. So this is our newer work trying to think about building up from very specific work on TV and sitcoms and, and going up. And I, um, and I, well, I argue as well in that TV actually is an incredibly powerful form of cultural heritage that gets understudied. If we want to understand the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, TV is the most watched content, right? Millions and millions of people. There's, these shows are still syndicated around the world. Bewitched, I Dream a Genie, I Love Lucy are still are still on TV, right? They're still streaming. They're translated. They're wrote. They are moving across. So if you want to talk about contagions or transmission or circulation, TV has this incredible circulatory power. So my appeal for TV as cultural heritage and why it's actually doing so much cultural work, even in its most mundane popularness, um, there's something really, I think, amazing in that power. So a little bit of background. Uh, so one of the things um, out of the film and studies world is that a lot of the folk has folk um, in literary and art history has focused on form and style and content of feature length films. Um, we know this from the work of Boardwell, et cetera, Barry Salt, and others who a lot of that work uh, focused on average shot length. There was a lot of manual annotation of aver average shot length, and now there's a lot of automated average shot length and median shot length work. Um, those who are familiar with like cinemetrics and those, those areas. Um, but a lot of this is focused on film. And so we're interested in expanding these kind of quantitative analysis to TV both for its scope, its scale, and to think about how we can think about style, form, and representation, other elements in TV over time. Um, just to give you an idea, a show like Bewitched or I Love Lucy has like 30 episodes over a, each about 28 minutes or so over 10 years. And you have to cut those, to, in order to do image analysis or do com uh, computer vision work on it, you have to cut them at the frame rate. So you're not talking about 100,000 images, or you're talking about millions of images that are building up very, very, very quickly to analyze one series or one TV show. So the scale and storage issue becomes really a big one for, for TV. Um, so in the 50s, the networks were uh, really big. Um, we, um, unlike your dispersed uh, streaming world right now where everyone can watch and engage in a, on a different platform, a, a different screen, you might have three screens in front of you right now that you are playing with, your Apple Watch, a, a telephone, a cell phone, and a computer. You might have four things open on your piece at once. Uh, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and more recently, uh, until more recently, you had that TV in the living room. And that's where it all came across. Uh, game shows, sitcoms, and police procedurals became a big part of the equation. Um, and um, as Paul Klein um, really lovingly wrote it, he wrote, called it the least objectionable program. Um, or, uh, or as you might, might be in contrast to what someone like Jason Mattel has called prestige TV, this was not, is not considered prestige TV, um, even though. So um, there has been a fair amount of work on the political and social and cultural life of films, but often they have to look at maybe one or two episodes. It's really actually hard to watch a whole season or a whole series and keep all of the elements in your head. Um, so social sciences have done work where they annotate, like they have people like students annotating, like physic, like writing down, like every time you see something, check, check, check. 
Uh, and a lot of this work, I think, opens up some possibilities to think about civil rights, second wave feminism, and urban rural divide um, with some really problematic imagery that was a part of these shows. And uh, so we can, um, and a lot of the evidence around it has focused on all the other archival work around it, but very rarely looking straight right at the show. And I, and I think seen is a really good example of why we need to bring those together, right? All the archival contextual evidence around and then with, in context with the visual or the sound elements. And our, so I love the formless, the middle brow, all of that fun. Uh, so, as I mentioned already, they're known for their consistent form and long runs, and um, actually they have a subtle patterns that we've been interested in trying to kind of put our finger on. I think um, a lot of times with media, we'll have people say, I know it when I see it. Like, I know what it feels like. I know when I'm watching it. Feel, I feel it. I know it. But part of the project of media studies and TV studies and film studies is to name that feeling, to name it. What is that feeling? What is that when, I, how do I know it? I know that feels like a sitcom, it must be a sitcom, but why do I know that? And that's so important to the humanities. So I'm gonna focus on quickly on two research questions that we are working on. And, um, one is how does the framing of a shot contribute to the pacing of an episode um, across series, times, and other features? And why, what and how do the visual and oral form of TV establish relationships and intimacy? And some of y'all might be familiar with previous work um, that others have done as well as ourselves just on visual relationships. So we're gonna add the sound and visual together. So the data. Uh, we're focusing right now on six series uh, across female-led from the earliest uh, decade. I'm happy to talk in Q&A about why we can access these films or these TV shows, thanks to some recent legal rulings in the US. Um, I spent all of last Friday on the phone with lawyers, so if you're interested in that context, welcome to chat. Um, luckily the university's paying, not me. Um, we have over uh, 30 seasons, uh, 918 episodes. It comes out to 28 terabytes uncompressed. So just again, the scale issue is real for this. Like, um, and how do we begin to actually think about chapter titles, breaks, subtitles, subtitles once you add all of those uh, elements? And I'll note the legal exemption in the US is this thing called DMC 1201 if you're interested in knowing more about that. So a little bit about our methods. Often when we're thinking about annotating uh, or distant viewing, we think about shot boundary detection, such as when, when is each shot. We might think about face detection, then face recognition. So we name the person, and you can see a probability next to them, like how likely is that that person. And then we can think about like object and person detection. Um, and I think we can unpack all day why in computer vision, objects include people as a category. So um, as a <laughs> interesting framing. As well, we can think about speaker detection and speaker segmentation, so the equivalent to face detection and face recognition. How can we actually do audio, audio processing at the same time to do that distinction? So one of the comments we've always gotten on our visual work is, well, that's great that they're on screen together, but what if they're not talking to each other? Or what if they're talking is separate? How does that relationship occur? And so one of the things, we, this is just some work on verifying that this, uh, that our ways of measuring worked, um, and we can talk, if you're interested in these kind of the elements, it's fine, just checking to um, confirm our process. So a little bit about the results of some of this work. One is on shot pacing. So one is a, uh, the average shot length or median shot length, which has been a really big computational metric of film and media studies. And one of the things you'll see here is that uh, actually that the shots are getting shorter. The pacing is picking up. Uh, the, the, the negative read on that is that like, you know, people are losing attention and this is like an earlier indicator of attention economy. I'm not sure that's accurate. I think it just has to do with ideas of some other reasons such as um, the types of comedy that people are engaging in as well as um, uh, uh, it might also be an indicator of industry um, advancements in camera operating and technology. Another we could see here is a relationship between those. 
So can we look for, for each show by the number of people present when you do these shots? So you can see the average shot length has less effect from zero to one people, but increases at two to three. So the average shot length is gonna go up as more people are on screen. So one of the things this brings up is shot type is not everything. Um, well, one chopped up is not everything, but that is one metric that we can begin to look at. And so if we put these together, we can start to look at the pacing. So uh, we start to see that uh, if we look at the, um, the oral side of the shows, we can calculate uh, after, a sh after each shot how long till a speech is detected. So you'll also see in I Love Lucy, it takes 1.2 seconds for speech to be detected after the shot versus Bewitch, where speech comes in quite quickly. And that can be one thing that we're thinking about as an indicator is, and I'll come back to this, is if you've seen these shows, you, we can think about some of the shifts in more physical comedy to the ways that narrative movement starts to move between the contestations between the characters, like the Darren and Samantha, the husband, wife, right? We can start to see that as a calculated, as a potential way to understand the way that they're um, moving. We can also look at character pairs. So we can measure the relationship between two characters and see how likely they are to be on screen together. So Darren and Samantha from Bewitched, they're the two, main, they're the, two the husband and wife, are on screen a lot, uh, and Jeannie and Tony. And if you're familiar with these shows, these are not gonna be deeply surprising that these characters are mostly on screen with each other. Um, you can then actually do what we, a two shot. We can actually look at how present they are with how likely they to be on screen together with another character. And then what we can start to add is voice. We can look when the two characters are in the two shot and then how often are the characters both speaking to each other. So we can start to layer these elements together for this who's on screen and who is off screen and then who's together in a two shot, so two people in the shot and then who, how, if they're talking. So what are some potential takeaways of beginning to build in this way and I, uh, of building analysis? Um, one is that the median and average shot length are correlated with the number of people present in the shot. So it's maybe one way of understanding average shot length is not that it's always just about pacing, but it is actually also another way of understanding shot type, which would be a real shift in understanding average shot length and what it's actually telling us about T TV and film and pacing um, and expands our possible annotations and understandings of them. And if you're familiar in the film study is circled, that's a, uh, a, um, it would be a, is a shift in our thinking on that one. Uh, time together on screen also can help highlight the strength of relationships between the characters and they're also often talking together. So there's a high correlation between on screen together and talking actually to each other. So sometimes the critiques can be like, are they off screen, are they talking off, right, and off, but you're actually seeing a lot of work of them working together. So one thing is that by putting these together that we can see that the visual information is actually doing a lot of work, that these can actually still be proxies for some of the other, um, other media effects that are occurring in the shows. And we can potentially use some of these findings as proxies for ways, um, other proxies for understanding the show. So we could use average shot length to also understand how many people are on screen. Um, and so what are some broader possibilities with this? I think we can think about um, how they can, one, I wanted to show how these multimodal computational, when we start to layer them, can actually start to think about some questions that impact TV studies. Um, it may not be, a, you know, uh, some may not be as interested in pacing or narrative form and those of TV, but uh, it is a whole area that a few people who are really excited about thinking about that in the way that you hear a lot of those conversations coming out of computational literary studies or others. But how do we, how do we know that, how do we know what that form is? How do we know it's a sitcom? How do we know it's TV? How do we know it's network? How do we know those things? And these are one element to computationally get at that. Another is um, thinking about how some of these computational approaches may be proxies for elements that we animate media studies, such as the kind of shot and pacing, in the same way that we might use computer vision to say find objects and say it's a proxy for a certain kind of dining room or a set or some other element. 
And then also thinking about access and retrieval for television and film. Um, one of the real challenges for multimedia, for uh, media archives for television film is we have um, places like the uh, uh, American Archive of Public Broadcasting have millions of hours of public television that is no documentation. So if we can use things like average shot length and face detection and say who's on screen, who's off screen, then we can identify and we can do layering. We could maybe think about opening up those archives in new ways. And that is it. Thank you. Yes, Susan. I'm sure you've thought of this, but I want you to develop a Bechtel test for TV and track it over time. Yes, yes, we ha yeah, there is, yes, definitely. There, and there's been some, we've done a little bit of work like that, but yeah, totally. I want to do a Bechtel, I also want to do a Bechtel test um, transnationally. So if anyone wants to do like a French and a like, like a bi, bi national. Oh, sorry. <laughs> do you, you want to? Oh, so it's a test for seeing how present um, women are, or uh, you could say female identifying characters are on screen, or women are on screen. Um, and, but it's more than just presence, it's whether they're talking to each other or they're receiving, they're only the recipient of language. So the common, adding voice plus visual, a lot of the Bechdel tests that people have done are just visual, whether the person's on screen, but a better implementation is are the women or uh, female identifying characters talking to each other. And, and not about men. No. And not about men, yes. And not about men. Not yes. About not about about men. Yeah. yes. No men, because they talk to each other. Yeah. About men that we can't. Yeah, exactly. And so much of TV is about, and, and film is, like any rom-com, romance comedy is like, it's technically, it's like a female lead, but they're just talking about the dudes all the time with a nice, like, male gaze close up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Um, two questions. Um, first, because unlike film, television, or at least US television, is known for directors and writers and director-writer teams who work together yeah. over a long period of time. And I wonder if you could begin to see patterns with individuals and and how they evolve or they their patterns might yeah. remain. And also, Great. I know there have been works about film in terms of shot length that has shrunk and you have two shows that, that spanned the 60s and into the 70s. Yeah. And I wonder if you could see patterns evolving within yeah. a particular show yeah. that would have a change of pace. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, those are great thing, open questions that we're looking to um, to do. Um, we've spent the last year advocating for, <laughs> three years, advocating for the legal conditions that have made it popular, pop, possible. So we've spent all of this fall ripping DVDs. So yeah, <laughs> you, my office looks like a, it like, blew up in the early 2000s with sitcoms, just like DVD packages <laughs> everywhere. No, those are great, thank you. And so just to, to go ahead with patterns, uh, is it possible to see some patterns between different genres of uh, TV series? Different genres? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we've, yeah, so um, it, we, we think so. Um, we started with sitcoms just to try out one whole genre, but we wanna, we have a colleague we're working with, hopefully um, Claudia Calhoun, who's an expert on um, uh, police procedurals, because uh, they rise in the same moment. Um, and I believe like, and they're back again, like uh, they're all, the old like 60s, 70s police procedurals are all being remade now in the US. So it'd be fun to compare them, the remakes to the previous, is it Perry Mason's back? Which one? One of the big ones is back. It's a reboot prequel, yeah. It, oh, okay. Well, it's good? Okay. See, TV cross everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm yeller. Hi. Um, because of the, the new attention to sound, I think you might also consider studying some of the radio 
precedence of oh, sitcoms. Yeah. Yeah. And and thinking about some of those temporal issues a la the, the sound. That's great because they, they establish many of the, the comedic patterns mm -hmm. and also the significance of laughter. So most of those radio shows yeah. were performed before live audiences and that's also the format for a lot of the early TV sitcoms. Yeah. And then the dreaded laugh track. Uh, yeah. I think you need to attend to that as well. Mm -hmm. But that, that's so exciting. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. And thank you for doing my living doll. That is oh. like <laughs> that is like the the outlier of yeah. that of that group. And it's about a robot, right? She's a female yeah. robot. Yeah. So bewitch. She's a genie. Yeah. Bewitch. She's a witch. Samantha's a witch. And then genie. She's a genie. And the but the original one, yeah, was she was supposed to be a robot. Yeah. Very strange. Thank you. Yeah, uh, right. No, never. Could you say please? <laughs> yes. Thank you for the presentation. Did, did you try to, um, to in, in order to evaluate how it matches the experience from the film editors, did you try to reach out to film editor communities? And I think especially the retired film editors, which were the editors for these movies, to, to know if, to present this, to, this information to them and to know if they had explicit, for instance, uh, directions for this kind of uh, shot uh, editing or uh, putting the, the, the speech just after the, the start of the shot in order to, to know how it matches their experience. Yeah, um, that's a great point about the, we haven't done that yet. This is work we just started doing. So we gotta figure out how to get into the archives, which um, are not as easy as one might hope. <laughs> Um, but it's a great point. Yeah, we'd love to get a hold of the editors and the uh, interview them if we if they're still with us. It's a great point. Uh, Jeanne? Yeah, so I have an online viewer who oh. was wondering, uh, how did you read the DVDs? Which tool did you use? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, you can write it down in the chat and... Uh, <laughs> uh, we we use some tools that you can download from the internet <laughs> that are online, um, and we definitely did it after the ruling from DMC 1201. Um, but seriously, we did. Um, uh, our first the reason we actually did Bewitch and I Dream a Genie the first round of this stuff was um, the DVDs were not under, uh, did not have digital rights management, so you could actually burn them without bypassing what's called digital rights management. Um, so there are some things online if you e Google digital rights management and DVD keys to do that. Um, you can, in the US, do this now legally if you um, buy the DVDs from, with your institution's money at an institution of higher education and you and you store your very valuable burned episodes of Bewitched and I Dream a Genie and My Living Doll on the on very high security level servers for very important data because you know My Living Doll and your medical data are really the same thing um, so yeah yeah so we have an and pr it's prestige TV, yeah, right. Um, actually, we're going to release an open educational resource in about probably three to uh, about a month that um, walks you through the entire process of how to rip them. Uh, one okay. last question. You had one? No. Hi, thanks, Lauren, for that. It was really great. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, what I find really interesting thinking back to Melvin's talk yesterday is that um, we're kind of faced here with two different approaches to multimodal analysis. Mm -hmm. So Melvin was talking about the contrastive image um, text uh, trainings and here it's more uh, working on two different corpora in quite linear um, fashions and then bringing them together in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in a contrastive way. Um, I just wondered when, the, if you were thinking of, of perhaps bringing like this sound decomposition stuff to something like the Distant Viewing Toolkit, and how you're thinking of maybe, in terms of interface, I mean, I know it's a text-driven yeah. Python package, but still questions about interface, 
is are you how how do you kind of approach designing that package so that people can cross these different uh, results of analyses, or is that something that's to be done outside of the package? It's not really. No, uh, no, it's a great question. Uh, uh, actually, we've already built some sound things into the distant viewing toolkit. If you like, um, from early on, because we just knew, like, since we were working with TV time, you know, disconnecting the two seemed um, like an issue. One might think that we might need a like scenes reckoning with like your name, we might need a broader name as well for the toolkit. But um, yeah, no, so that's a great point. Uh, I think that's something we need to figure out how to do is to make it clear how to connect the sound with the audio. We did this obviously all in R, putting it back together and alignments and it's, it's no joke to do that. So yes, yeah, something we should, I'll, in my mental checklist from everyone, I'm gonna add to the to the to the next steps, and if people are interested in collaborating on something like that, would love to, would love to think across those together. So yeah, yeah, to come, hopefully. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you.